Uh, Mike is going to come now, and he and Pastor Chris have uh, another special announcement. Yeah. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Mike Braden. I'm on the leadership team here at Crosswinds. Uh, and we have an announcement uh, with Chris up here, um, a big one that we have actually been planning for about a year and then the last six months really digging into the details to make it work and make it happen. So we are happy and excited to announce, and the reason I'm up here is to announce this, and also to reassure you everything is fine. So first off, we are very excited that Pastor Chris here gets to take a sabbatical this summer. So for, yes, awesome. We're very excited for him to take some time off. So for essentially, I think, the month of June and July... He will be off and uh, d spending time with Ashley, his family, uh, pouring in and getting poured into from other peers, uh, people from his past life in pastoring. My Things past like life? Past life <laughs> in past pastoring. Life. <laughs> Stuff he did up in New York, if I remember right. So, um, My past life. And just also spending time on his own for himself in the Word. You know, you think a lot of times, a lot of the stuff he does is for here, he's working on sermons, doing that stuff, and now he can spend a lot of time pouring into himself and his relationship with God. And so we wanted to bring that up, announce that to everybody so you're not shocked for two months that you might not see Pastor Chris around. And we don't expect him to be here, not worrying about this place. We've got a great team here that will lead us through all that, um, and they're set up to do that. But also make sure you understand that Chris is good, family's good, there's no, the church is in a great spot. This is not a He's done something wrong, and we need to send him off for a while. Um, we actually feel like this is a great place where he is in a good spot, the church is in a great spot, and this is a good time to do this. Now, the church has been growing, and some might think, oh, my gosh, we're pastors leaving for two months during this growth period, but we didn't really plan it that way, to be honest with you. Yeah. But we also realize that it's one of those things that if he doesn't take the time now, we'll always come up with an excuse not to do it. So we wanted to send him off, that he's got the two months off to go spend time take some time, and if you look into this, they kind of expect, and we have set up, that pastors should have every seven years some kind of sabbatical time, and so we're setting it up to start that way, and I think you told first service that you haven't in your whole pastoral career yeah. taken a sabbatical, so it's yeah. right time for him to take some time off, so yeah. we wish him well and luck, and Chris, anything else you want to say? Yeah, it's, uh, it's just, uh, I really appreciate the leadership team just giving me the ability to do that. Um, you know, pastoring can really be different than any other, uh, than most other occupations because you really don't, you can't shut your mind down. Um, it's really challenging when you're trying to help people. You, like I told the first service, you can be there like this past week, you can be there at people's one of their most worst time when they're actually experiencing death in their family. And then at the end of the week, you can be there when you're celebrating with somebody the beginning of a marriage um, and, and it, it just deal with a whole range of emotions and all those kind of things. And so just really being able to take some time off. Um, I'm coming up on 25 years in, in ministry. And to be honest with you, I want to be able to pastor this church another 25 years if the Lord would give me that ability. Um, and so during this time, you can be praying for me, my fa our family, um, because I really want the Lord to give me just a vision for what the next 10 years looks like for this church um, and what that what that means. Um, and so just really excited about that. We've got a great staff. Um, Pastor Josh will be doing some preaching. Um, Ronnie will be doing some preaching. We have some retired pastors that will be doing some preaching throughout the summer. We'll be walking through the book of Psalms. And so it's going to be just an incredible time. So I'm really excited. So don't stop coming. If you come because of me, then you come for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. Because this church is not centered around me. It's centered around Jesus. And you can get something from other people just as well as you can get it from me. So I just want you to know that because we're trying to, the church is about making a difference in the lives of people and it doesn't center around one person. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, just so happens that God put me in this position to help continue to move the church forward. So I just really appreciate that. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Awesome. We also, um, just in transition before we um, continue just our uh, time of singing, um, we wanted to take a moment and pray for Pastor Scott. Um, uh, some of you may know, but most of you probably don't, that for about four months now, Pastor Scott's just been dealing with some physical stuff that's going on that I'll let him share um, in, in just a little bit. 
um, but he's had some physical stuff that's been going on. And I find it really interesting that now he uh, is our second staff member that has um, began to just be affected physically in a time when the church is growing probably more than it's ever been. Which, to be honest with you, I wonder if it's part of the enemy trying to uh, to do something. You know, I don't always like to give the enemy credit, okay, because he doesn't deserve credit. Um, but um, we just, so we wanted to take a moment and just pray for Pastor Scott. So I'm going to ask him to come on down here and uh, his wife and his family. I think they're here. And so if you would like to, I'd like for you to come down. I don't know, do you want to say something now or do you want to wait till after we pray? Okay. Um, so if you guys want to come, some of our leadership team and um, some of our volunteers, just anybody, if you're here and you would like to take a moment and um, just help us to pray for Pastor Scott. I realize that too, that there may be stuff that you're walking through this morning, maybe even physically, um, much like Pastor, Pastor Scott. What I love about the beauty of this church is what you see right here, right now, is that... Um, it's okay um, to not be so structured as a church that we can actually stop and take time to pray for people, okay? Um, and so I just wanted to, to be able to do that. I'm going to anoint Pastor Scott, and we're just going to pray over him. So if you would um, bow your heads and close your eyes and just let's pray together. The Bible says that, um, you know, when somebody's um, going through something that we're to call the body together. It says to call the elders of the church um, and the body of Christ to pray over each other. And so that's what we're doing for Pastor Scott. Jesus, we just come before you and we thank you for who you are. And uh, God, right now, I just anoint Pastor Scott in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would touch his body um, for whatever reason um, you've allowed this to touch him. And, uh, God, we know that uh, it's no surprise to you. And, uh, God, I just pray that you would um, start the healing process right now Mm -hmm. over his body. Um, I know that this has been just a big emotional, um, emotional journey for him as well. And uh, so, God, I just pray that not only would you touch him physically, but you would touch him emotionally, even spiritually, God, that you would encourage him uh, during this time. God, I thank you for Pastor Scott, and I thank you for um, the gift that you gave us in um, allowing us just to connect over 13 years ago and um, just the value that Scott has um, had for this church uh, and continues to have, and there are so many parts um, about him that have impacted this community that most of us never would even know. And so, God, I just thank you for that. I thank you for what you continue to do in him, for what you continue to do through him. And so, God, we just wanted to come around him and, and Rebecca and their family this morning and um, uh, be a part of Um, the love and support and the prayer for them as he continues just to walk through this. Um, Again, would you heal him Mm -hmm. in the name uh, of Jesus? And we just give you all the glory and honor and praise for who you are, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Just so it's not left vague, um, and, and I hate this. I hate this kind of attention. I love attention. <laughs> I hate this kind of attention. Um, but literally overnight um, in early January, like literally one day difference, um, I got uh, psoriasis. And um, if you don't know what that is, it's my body attacking itself. Um, on my skin, the medication, the only medication that works, I can only get a small tube of once a month, and so I put it on my hands and my face so I don't freak y'all out. Um, Because mild psoriasis is about 5% coverage of your body, and and I'm at about 90. Um, There used to be this practice in Imperial China called death by a thousand cuts, and um, that's what it feels like 24 hours a day. 
and I'm angry, and I'm bitter. Um, I lashed out at Chris when he asked if the church could pray for me. Um, but anyway, uh, again, I hate this. This is, this is stupid. Um, <laughs> You just don't like crying. Uh, I don't. I really don't. <laughs> I'm so mad at you right now for making this happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I appreciate the prayers. I really do. I mean, because it's, it's literally the top of my head to, like, this hurts. It's the bottom of my feet. Huh? Okay. Um, Dr. Michael. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you. Amen. If you would stand as we uh, prepare to continue in worship, and I said this in first service, I'm going to say it again now, this, the importance of, of what we just did <clears throat> can't be stressed enough. Um, this works, and if you didn't believe it before, I believe it now, I believe it now enough for all of us. Um, You know, I said earlier that, um, you know, I, I'm not thankful for his condition, but I am thankful for the opportunity to reciprocate um, what, what he and so many others did for me uh, a few weeks ago. And, you know, the, the evidence and the proof is, is visible every single week um, in this church, and I just, I'm thankful to be in a place that puts the importance on prayer and trust in the power of Jesus' name. So if you would, join us as we worship that name again today. Amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How you guys doing? Yeah, man. Great to see you guys. Glad you're here. If this is your first time, we are glad that you are here and believe that God has something for you. You know what? You can try and do life without God. You can try to do things your own way. You can try to ignore God today. And let's be honest, we live in a culture that's trying to ignore God. Trying to, trying to strip everything that we possibly can, take the things of God and strip them from every part of our life. But the reality is you can't do that. You can't do it. We, we started talking last week about this whole idea of, of, of peace in our life. You see, because we started talking a couple of weeks ago, just before Easter, we talk, started talking about the disciples and kind of what they were walking through, this journey that they were going through in the last week of, of, life, of the uh, life of Christ uh, before he went to the cross and died on the cross. And then last week, we started this journey of looking at the disciples and what they actually tr trying to put ourselves in their situation and try and understand what they experienced after all, all they had seen and been through. So, so Jesus comes riding in on a donkey, and they are singing Hosanna, Hosanna. They're laying their cloaks down. He's coming in. They think he's coming in as the, as the conquering king into Jerusalem. And uh, within a few short days, Jesus is arrested in the garden, and then he is beaten, and he's put hung on a cross, and then he's, he's put into a tomb after a few hours of hanging on the cross, and then he's put into a tomb, and the disciples aren't sure what to think. And I believe they were probably asking the question, now what? Now what do we do? We've, 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 we've seen Jesus do all these miraculous things. We've seen him 
come into town and now we've seen him arrested and now we've seen him hung on a cross and now we've seen him put into a grave, but now what? And then we talked a little bit last week that the Gospels actually began to tell us about what was next for the disciples. And we started talking about that out of John chapter 20 and this morning we're going to talk about John chapter 21, the first seven verses. And we started talking about how there are things in life that we just don't understand. There are things in life that God allows to touch our life that, to be honest with you, we just can't understand, we can't wrap our minds around. There, death happens in life, and we can't always understand or explain it, or or things happen in our life, like Pastor Scott, we can't always explain it, we can't always figure it out, or situations happen, and we, we ask the question, okay, God, what are you doing, and now what am I supposed to do? How do I find peace in these circumstances and in these situations? And how do I find purpose for my life in this? And where is God? Where are you? I don't even know where you are. I'm not even sure that you're real. I don't even know if you really exist. And we begin to have some of those questions. Maybe some of you obviously have already settled that in your mind, but maybe you're even wrestling with some of those questions here this morning. And the only way to find peace, the only way to find peace in life these, these days is in relationship with Jesus because you can go looking for peace anywhere else, but to be honest with you, you will not find it except for in relationship with Jesus. We started talking a little bit, and I'm, I, I didn't really know first service how far to go with all this, but let's be honest, the you know, there are a lot of people who are looking for peace in their political system, and to be honest with you, you're just not going to find it. You're looking for peace in politicians, they're not going to do it for us. You're looking for peace on Facebook, you're not going to find it. You may be looking for peace in other things. You're looking for peace in the bottle, and you're just not going to find it. You're looking for peace from another person, you're not going to find it. And as much as, as much as I love my wife and as much as there is peace in our relationship, if I'm expecting her to provide peace for my life, then I'm, I, my expectations are wrong. And it's all about this finding peace and pursuing God. And I love the fact that we just sang a song, how, Jesus, how God pursues us. Right? He kicks down. I love that. I love the thought of that. I always have that picture in my mind of Jesus walking up to the door, kicking it in and running in the house. To think that's, that's just here. Kung Fu Jesus, right? And him coming in just because that's how desperately, that's how desperately he went to the cross for us. And so now we're looking at John chapter 21 and we see some of the we see some of the disciples who are trying to navigate some of this. Jesus has gone, this person that they've been following for three years, and they've seen him do these miracles, and now all of a sudden their question is, well, now what do we do? And we find, find that in John chapter 21, verse 1 through 7, it says this, Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas, also known as Didymus, Uh, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Now, I want to stop right there for just a moment because what we know to be true about this passage is there was a point in time where Jesus actually went to Peter, okay, Peter being one of these guys, where Jesus actually went to Peter and he said before Jesus died, he said, Peter, come, uh, Jesus said to Peter, Come and follow me. And there was a moment in Peter's life at that moment when Jesus said, Come and follow me. I want you to be my disciple. That, G- that Peter stopped fishing. It says he dropped everything he did because he wanted to follow Jesus. He believed in what Jesus was doing. So he, he stopped the very thing that he knew and started following Jesus. Now, what's really interesting, what's really interesting about this is that Jesus found these guys in Galilee, okay? You're like, well, why does that matter? Because that's exactly what Jesus told them to do before he died. Now, I find that really interesting because 
So Jesus had been telling the disciples about this time coming, and I don't know that they fully understood it, but they probably they must have grasped some of it because at some point after Jesus' death, he they the Peter and the disciples packed up and they went to Galilee. And so here's what I want us to understand about that this morning is that they went to Galilee because Jesus told them to. Again, understand something. When Jesus died, all of the disciples went into hiding. Some abandoned them. And now we have Jesus who's come back up from the grave, and now he actually finds his disciples where he told them to go. Sometimes when things don't make sense, we just need to go where we've been told to go. Even though they didn't fully understand, they still obeyed the words of Jesus when he told them to go to Galilee. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 3. It says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. So I'll stop there for just a moment. Again, I told you a little bit earlier but that, that there was one point in Peter's life where Jesus came to him and said, hey, I want you to be my disciple. Jesus dropped, I mean, Peter dropped everything and he went and followed Jesus. Now Jesus is gone. He's, he's, they've seen him hung on a cross. They've seen him laid into a tomb. Now they haven't found him in a tomb, right? Because Mary, two, the two Marys went running to the tomb. And even at one point, Peter goes running to the tomb and finds that the tomb is empty. Now, what I find really interesting is that Peter went back to doing fishing. He went back to fishing. So I, I thought about this, and there's actually two things that kind of come out of that, this specific part of the passage that commentaries kind of teach and kind of think about Peter. Sometimes we have to assume some things. But here, we, what we understand to, to know about this is that Peter went back to fishing because it's what he knew how to do. You see, they were uncertain. The disciples were uncertain with what to do next. The very person that they had been following for three years was now gone. Now what do we do? And so the only thing they knew to do was to go back and do the very thing that they knew to do. You see, they were uncertain with what to do. And when we don't know what to do, what we should do is wait on God's timing and we should keep doing what we know we're supposed to do. Do the things that God has actually at some point, hopefully, told us to do. The problem is, most of the time, we don't listen or we're not good at waiting and listening to hear God tell us what to do. And so that's the problem. As that of a culture, we, our culture keeps speeding up. I don't know if you've noticed that, but life keeps getting faster. And, and the culture seems to keep getting faster, and, and it becomes harder and harder for us to slow down because the space, the the, the pace of life is elevating. And here's what I find interesting about Jesus. Jesus was never in a hurry. Jesus always took time for people. It was so important to him that he even took time to get out into the wilderness and listen to his father. That's how important. And I'm pretty sure if it's important for Jesus to go out to the wilderness and spend some time with his father, it's probably important for us to do that too. And so they went back to fishing. Now, so they did what they knew they were supposed to do. But on the other hand, here's the negative part of the fact that Peter and those guys went back to fishing was this. How often do we go back to the very thing Jesus called us away from? We know that there's something that God called us to. And, and when things don't turn out the way that we thought they would, would turn out, then we go back to doing them, we go back to doing the things that we did before. It's kind of like insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. 
Because, see, the very thing is that Jesus has shown up to, to Peter, and he has said, hey, come and follow me. And Peter dropped everything, and he went and followed Jesus. Now, why did he not find it important to be following Jesus in this moment? Just because Jesus was not there. Why did he not find it important to be about the Father's business, about what Jesus had called him to? And how often do we go back to the very thing that Jesus called us away from? See, I think there's obviously two schools of thought there. You go back to doing what you know or is easy, or you go back to what you know you shouldn't go back to. And so I'll let God deal with you on how that fleshes out in your own life. And then verse 5, he says, he called, he called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the, si on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Now, I find it really interesting. Okay, put yourself in this situation. You've gotten into the boat. You've gone out. There it says that they were about 100 yards, so they were about a football field out. And all of a sudden, they see this guy on the shore. Must have been early in the morning. They said some commentary say some scholars say that it could have been like a mist over the lake or whatever, and and this this man's hollering at you, right? You've been fishing all night. Anybody stayed up all night working on something? All of a sudden, then to have somebody else come up and say, "Hey, you're doing it wrong," right? They don't even know at this point. They don't even know who this is. They've been at, they're expert fishermen. I don't know if you're a fisherman here, but if you're a fisherman, you don't like other fishermen telling you what to do. Especially not as simple as say, hey, you've just got your nets on the wrong side of the boat, right? Aren't the same fish on the right side that are on the left side? But they've been out there fishing all night and they haven't caught anything. And Jesus hollers out to them, hey guys, hey, why don't you just take your net and drop it on the other side of the boat. This wasn't like a boat that was like a yacht, okay? This was like a little boat. So it probably was only five or six, seven feet to the other side. And it says, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, I love this, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him. Not sure if he was like fishing his, in his underwear, skivvies, right? So he wrapped his outer garment around him, and it says he jumped into the water and began to swim because at that point he realized that it was Jesus. Maybe Peter thought he could walk on water, right? Well, I've done it once. Let's try it again. So he jumps out of the boat, and it says, but I love the passion of Peter that he was so, he wanted so much to get to Jesus in this moment. I mean, can you imagine being on that boat, and you've been fishing all night, and then you just throw your, some man tells you, throw your, throw your nets on the other side, and then all of a sudden you got more fish than you can handle? And as we think about that, and I started to think about what that meant, I wrote down these two things. Life works better with the guidance of God. You see, we can try to do life without Him. But life works better with the guidance of God. And my question for that is, what have you chosen to put your faith in today? You see, because when life happens and things that we can't fully understand happen, and we come to these moments where we're struggling to find peace and we're struggling to find purpose, we're struggling to even understand what God is doing through the situations that he allows in our life, and we are in those moments where we're saying, well, now what? The only way to find peace and purpose is to trust in the guidance of God. To take even small steps of faith. Let's be honest. 
you, you would think that a experienced fisherman would say, you're just at the wrong fishing hole. You need to take your boat down and take a, take a right and go down a little ways and stop there. There's a great fishing hole. I've fished it before, and you can catch a whole lot of fish there. But all Jesus said was, take your net and just throw it on the other side of the boat. You see, God works even in the small. He works in the smallest steps of I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you're still just trying to figure things out spiritually. Maybe there are some things that you have, God has told you to do in the past, and you went back to doing what you knew how to do instead of doing the very things that Jesus told you to do. But maybe your small step for this morning is just to start reading the Bible. Maybe it's to take a few minutes and start trying to engage in a conversation with Jesus throughout your day. Spend some time talking to him. Maybe your small step is just showing up for church more than when it's convenient. Maybe it's to start talking to someone that you trust about spiritual things. That you can share the things that you don't fully understand. I had a, I had a friend back in New York. And uh, we got into conversations. We played basketball together. His name was Kevin. He was a huge dude. He was probably like 6'3". 6'4". He landed on me one time, about broke my lip ribs. But he called me one day. We started, they started going to church with Ashley and I, and he called me one day, and he had started reading his Bible. And he said, these, these were the first words out of his mouth. <laughs> he said, hey, man, can you explain this whole no, this whole Noah thing to me because I don't understand what the hell it's saying. <laughs> You're like, oh, Pastor Chris just cussed. And I loved it because it said to me that he got into the Bible. And so maybe your start, small step of faith is just to start reading the Bible. Maybe it's to talk to somebody about spiritual things. Maybe it's to become a part of a small group. Maybe it's to invite someone. Maybe God's trying to been, he's been trying to get your attention that there's somebody in your life that he just wants you to invite to church. Whatever it may be. Your faith. It can grow by just taking small steps. And trusting what God has. On the other side of the boat. I believe we're in a day and time where we see spiritual things that are less a part of our culture. And I believe we're in a time where the church has to begin to grow. It has to continue to walk in faith. It has to continue to believe that Jesus wants to do these things in us that we just never thought that he might. To be a light in our community. To be people of peace. To be people of purpose. To be people who help others know how to navigate the questions of now what? What do I do now? And so it takes us being able to take moments 
like we're in and like moments that we'll be in in the days ahead because I can't promise you that life's going to get easy. I had a conversation. I shared this with the first service. I kind of wrestled with it first service. and But I'll be just honest with you. I had a conversation this past week with a guy. We were talking about how what, what was kind of transpiring in our culture. Do you know that Things that happen in culture affect the church, right? Yes, we are to be a light, but we have to understand what's happening in the culture around us. And I don't know if you've paid attention, but I believe that America is probably not far away from a food shortage I'm not trying to scare you here this morning. But I believe it's important for the church to talk about biblical things. I think there's there's sin that's happening in our culture that the church needs to talk about. And I hope to talk about those in the days ahead. That some churches are saying, well, this is okay, but it's not. But I was just really challenged by this because I believe it's important for the church to be helping people be prepared for what's ahead. I believe that America is not far from a food shortage. Did you know that 50% of the world's fertilizer is in Russia and in the Ukraine? There are probably more than 20 farms that have been shut down in America that are some of the largest producers of food in America. And if you go to the grocery store, you'll probably see it. And I don't say that, I don't say that to scare you. I'm saying that to you to help you prepare because as a church, we want to be prepared for whatever God has for us. We want to be prepared to be able to help people if they don't have any food. But it's just understanding that there are things that are happening that we have to be prepared for. You see, let's be honest. We live in an Amazon world. You go on the Internet, you order it, and you have it within two days. And the only way that we're going to find peace, the more that chaos is created, and I, I believe that. I believe the enemy is against us. I believe the enemy is against what's going on. I believe that, to be honest with you, I think we create some of our own chaos. People profit off of chaos. I'm not trying to be political, okay? But I just think we need to be prepared. And the only way to find peace in those moments is small steps of faith. To trust God with what he has. It doesn't mean we're lazy. It just means we pay attention. It means we, we take those small steps of faith to get into his word, to have a relationship with him, to be able to find peace in those things and understand that there's purpose because we just sang a song that Jesus is coming back. And so we can stand on the faith And the foundation of that as we continue to move forward in the days ahead. Let's pray. God, I just thank you. I thank you for your incredible love for us. I I thank you, God, that we don't have to worry As your word says, we don't have to stress. That just because the world is changing, you never change. And God, I pray that you would help us much like the disciples to be able to navigate things that we don't understand, whether we're in the midst of it right now, whether it's stuff that we've experienced in the past or it's stuff that we're walking through right now or it's stuff that may happen in the days ahead. That we can walk in peace 
and hope and faith. And so God, would you grant us that wisdom this morning? If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ and you'd like to say yes to Jesus today, to be honest with you, it's just a small step, just like Jesus told the disciples to throw their nets on the other side. I believe it's just saying yes to Jesus today. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I've been trying to do this all on my own. Come into my life. Forgive me for my past. And today I want to begin a new in relationship with you. And that's the best way to find peace in life. Maybe you're here and you know that there are some things that God's told you to do. Much like Peter. And maybe you've walked away from it at some point. And maybe God's saying to you today, it's time to go back. Maybe you just need God to be a part of the process. Because you've been trying to do things on your own. I trust that what you've spoken today that would resonate in the hearts of people God they wouldn't remember or see my words but they would hear your voice much like the disciples when you hollered out to them they didn't really know who you were at that moment but they still just did told them to do. God, we know that you love us. And you have an incredible plan for our lives and purpose. And so God, would you continue to help us just to pursue that in our life? Jesus, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand? Let's sing a song together.